Good morning, guys. Welcome to Gate City. Let me invite everybody to stand to your feet for a moment. Glad that you're here. If you're sitting in the front row, you got a chance to watch me wipe out in the first stair here, but I'm okay. Thanks for asking. Let's take a moment to pray. Invite the presence of the Holy Spirit to join us this uh, morning into afternoon. Great weather outside, but God could do some great things inside today. Amen. All right, well, let's pray for a moment. So, Father, thank you so much for this opportunity you've given us to gather to worship you, Holy Spirit. We invite your presence in a rich way this morning. We are desperate to wanna see lives transformed, but we're more desperate to wanna connect with you as well. Join us in our worship unto you in the matchless name of Jesus in Gate City. Let me hear you say amen this morning. Amen, let's worship. All right, everybody, let's invite him. Just invite him, raise your arms. Set your gaze on him. Let's invite him with praise and thanksgiving and adoration and worship to come walk among us, to dwell with us. Will we set our gaze on you, Jesus. Sing let our praise. Oh, let our praise be your welcome. And let our songs be a sign.
us to hear our voice. You alone are holy. Only you are worthy. God, let your fire fall down. Oh, let your fire fall down. We welcome you so we can give you our crowns, God. We crown you with many crowns, Jesus.
in our midst. So whatever you have need, the Lord's here.
but his gaze on you, Jesus. We declare you the King of glory. You're the only one worthy.
Let's sing that to him. Honor and majesty, wisdom, might to the Lord. We're just about done playing church. We want to give blessing and honor. To Glory the and power. Honor and majesty, wisdom, and might to the Lamb. Oh, blessing and honor. Glory and power. on Israel 300 missiles and drones first time in history that Iran has struck Israel in this way and of 300 missiles and drones it was the largest drone strike that's ever happened in the world ever 300 missiles and drones 99% failed shocking we're going to take a moment right now. We're going to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We're going to ask salvation to break out in Israel. Yeah. 
this flow, this spirit that we're in right now, I believe it's an intercessory flow to declare the King of Glory over Israel, declare Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah of Israel. Lord, in the name of Jesus, right now, we lift up Israel. We lift up your people. And we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We thank you, God, for the testimony. We thank you for the protection over the weekend. And we are asking, God, that you would protect Israel. And we're not praying a geopolitical prayer. We're praying in the Spirit, asking for a breakthrough, asking for salvation. Lord, we ask, let salvation spring up. Let the Word of God run swiftly. Let there be a great deliverance. Let there be a great breakthrough in Israel. We pray for many to come to Jesus, that they would know Yeshua, their Messiah. We crown you, King of Glory. We crown you, King of Glory. We crown you, King of Glory. Over Israel. We crown you, King of Glory. We crown you, King of Glory. We crown you, King of Glory. across this room let's just lift our hands to Jesus I would just tell you I'm so tired of playing church I just want Jesus to come I just want Jesus to have his way just want the king of glory to have his glory come Lord Jesus come Lord Jesus release your kingdom here release your power here release your glory here release deliverance here kingdom come will of God be done everything you desire to do today I ask you mark us and meet us today that not one of us would leave the same way we came Would you just pray that with me? Just put your hand on your heart. Just say this, say, Jesus, I don't want to leave the same way I came. Mark me, meet me, move in our midst. In the name of Jesus, amen. Come on, can we just give the Lord a great hand of praise in this house? Just stay standing for a moment. And let's just take a few moments. Let's just greet one another, welcome one another. Maybe find somebody you don't know this morning. Love on them this morning. Welcome to Gate City this morning. God bless you. Good morning, Gate City. So good to be here with all of you today. 
So before we continue with the rest of service, there is a group of people that we want to welcome today, and that is our first time guest. So Gate City, let's welcome our guests today. So glad that you're here, and also welcome to those of you that are joining us online. I just want to draw your attention to something. If you are a visitor, what I have here in my hand, this is a connection card. If you look in the back of the seat in front of you, you'll see a pocket and a connection card in there. We just ask that you would take a few moments of your time and fill this out. We would love to get you connected with everything that we have available for you at Gate City. And if you have your cell phone and you don't feel like writing, you can flip it over and on the back you can scan the QR code and you can fill it out digitally and that way we make sure we get your information in correctly. Then at the end of service, we just want to invite you out in the lobby. We have our glass lounge. That is our next room. We want to get a gift into your hands. So after service, come and join us in the lounge. And if you have to run out, you can deposit this in the black boxes on the way out. Now at this time, if you would direct your attention to the screens, we have a few video announcements. Thank you. Good morning, Gate City. My name is Angel. And I am Sun. Here at Gate City, for the worth of Jesus, we are building an altar of night and day worship and prayer, discipling our spiritual family around the table to go deep in the knowledge of God and taking the gospel to the road from our neighborhoods to the nations. We have opportunities for all of us to engage as a spiritual family. So make sure to scan the QR code right here on the screen or on the seat back in front of you so you can follow along and click the links to see the announcements. This is also where you can find notes and how to give. We are super excited to announce that this summer, we are hosting a Gatekeepers Intensive for anyone ages 18 through 25, and registration is now open. This intensive will be a time where you are immersed in prayer, worship, teaching, evangelism, and community for 10 weeks. You will also get to spend time in Night Watch and go on missions trips. It's gonna be amazing. Registration for the intestines closes on May 1st, so sign up while you still can. We also wanted to let you know that we are having our monthly baptisms during our second service next Sunday. If you have never been baptized, we encourage you to sign up, come and experience the power of making a public declaration of your faith in Christ. You can sign up for the intensive or for baptisms through the QR code on the seat back in front of you. Now, time for offering. Yo, what's up, Gay City fam? Let's go! Love it, love it. Gatekeepers fam, y'all are, oh, I love y'all so much. Love y'all. All right, so we're gonna advance our worship into a time of giving. I wanna invite everybody to turn to their um, Bibles. I got a paper Bible here. But if you're digitally inclined, you can turn to Genesis 14 in your app as well too. And so we're going to um, exhort from a passage here the first time that we see the president of the uh, principle of the 10th being offered. And we're going to read in Genesis 14 verses 19 through 24. Here are a couple more pages turning. So I'll let it get there. All right. Verse 18, actually. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now, he was a priest of the Most High God. He blessed Abram, saying, Bless be Abram by the Most High God, creator of heaven and earth, worthy of praise is the Most High God, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Abraham gave Melchizedek a tenth of everything. Then the kingdom, king of Sodom, said to Abram, Give me the people and take the possessions for yourself. But Abraham replied to the king of Sodom, I raise my hand to the Lord, the Most High God, creator of heaven and earth, and vow that I will take nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the strap of a sandal. That way you can never say, it is I who made Abram rich. So, right here earlier on, the father of our faith is showing that there are two kingdoms at war for our heart when it comes to our offering. And there's one that blesses and then there's one that takes. And so we have the opportunity to give and offer to the one that blesses us. 
We're in the Sermon on the Mount teaching series right now, and the Beatitudes are all about blessing. And so we have a God that begins and institutes his kingdom with blessing. And so we get a chance to step into that today. Paul says it a couple of different ways. He says, you have been um, given every spiritual blessing. And God became poor so that way we could become rich. So we're giving out of the place of abundance in the spirit, and it's not based on our natural circumstances. So I want to invite us to give from that heart, from give from that, that posture, from that place that we're already rich, we're already blessed, and we get to go show God thanksgiving with our blessing. So I'm going to pray for us and invite us to extend our worship, not only in the song, but also with our giving. So Father, we love you. Thank you that you are such a good Father that gives amazing gifts, most notably the gift of your Son. You are generosity, and you expressed yourself and showed it to us by giving us the best gift that we could ever have, the blood of Christ that makes us rich in heaven. And so from that place, we give with gratitude and thankfulness from our hearts and say, you deserve the best. You are the, you give us blessings, so we bless you back. In Jesus' name, let's worship as we give. Because I'm caught up in your presence. And I just want to sit here on your feet. Caught up in this holy moment, I never want to leave. If you know it, sing along. Cause I'm not here for blessing. Cause Jesus, you don't owe me anything. I'm more than anything that you can do. I just want you. I just want you, Lord. Cause I just want you and nothing else, and nothing else, and nothing else will do. Cause I just want you and nothing else, and nothing else. I just want you and nothing else, and nothing else, and nothing else will do. Cause I just want you, Lord, and nothing else, and nothing else, nothing else will do. Cause I'm caught up in your presence Lord I just want to sit here at your feet caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave cause I'm not here for blessing Oh, Jesus, you don't owe me anything more than anything that you can do. I just want you. Come on, just you sing, I just want you. Because I just want you.
Amen. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate you, Jim Stern. Well, before I bring up our guest speaker, I just want to highlight, if you are a young adult and you're interested in that gatekeeper's intensive that was mentioned in the announcements, we, the interest meeting is in room 12, directly following the service, and it's going to be a 10-week time of going deep into the knowledge of God in prayer, fasting, doing it in community. And my wife and I are going to take a front seat role in mentoring the young adults that are part of that internship, that intensive. And so I really want to encourage you, if you don't have plans for this summer, that's your plan. There it is. I just gave you a plan. (laughs) Room 12, immediately following the service. We'd love to talk to you, connect with you, give you more information. The deadline to sign up is May 1st. Amen. Well, uh, this morning, we've got Corey Russell with us. And, you know, we, we try to bring Corey in about once a year minimum. Sometimes it's a little, even a little more than that. And, um, you know, he, he and I, are, we're running buddies. I mean, we're partners in crime. We do a podcast together called Gripped, and we just did our seventh season yesterday. We just recorded the whole season on the Sermon on the Mount, so that'll be coming out here shortly. But uh, I, I want to mention this. We don't just have Corey come and speak because he's Billy's buddy, because he's my friend. We have him come because he carries the spirit of prayer almost like nobody else we know. And when it comes to, like, I mean, I've got a lot of friends, but they don't all come here and speak. So when it comes to people that I know, people that we know, I can't think of a person that I would rather have imparting to us around the issue of prayer. I can't think of another person I'd rather have than Corey Russell. And so this is strategic and intentional, and it speaks right into our culture, altar, table, and road. As we're building this altar of night and day worship and prayer, we bring Corey in as a means to stoke that fire and call us into that place. Does that make sense? So this morning, we've asked him to uh, preach on prayer from the Sermon on the Mount as a part of our culture of the kingdom series. And so he's going to come and bring a word on prayer. But I want you to sit on the edge of your seat, to open your heart, and to draw on the word of the Lord that you might receive an impartation of the spirit of prayer this morning. How many will do that today? Really lean in and believe God. Awesome. So with that, I want you to welcome with me Corey Russell as he comes and speaks. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Let's go. Love it, man. You guys never heard of Gripped? Check it out. Podcast. We just uh, recorded again season seven yesterday. It's a blast. We come in and just pound 10, 30 minute sessions. And as soon as me and Billy get together, it sparks flying. So it's a blast. I love it. Uh, I love being with you guys. Hey, I, I'm about to jump into the uh, the word. Before I do, here in two weeks, uh, we're going to be in Fayetteville, North Carolina, probably about a four and a half, five hour drive for some of you, many of you, um, uh, having what we're calling, and I don't know if you have that slide, the uh, Nasserite Regional slide. Uh, who's ever heard of Charles Finney before? Okay. Charles Finney was the premier evangelist during the Second Great Awakening. And they say during a season that they would see upwards of 500,000 new converts swept into the kingdom in a matter of of weeks in upstate New York. There was an intercessor by the name of Daniel Nash who would forerun Charles Finney's revivals and would intercede for the breakthrough of God. And Finney saw this connection between intercession and revival evangelism. And me and my wife got so touched by this, uh, this tandem we have three daughters. I have my youngest with me today. Oh, come on. She's 13. She's powerful. She's going to change the world. She's going to change the world. She's powerful. Um, <laughs> uh, we also had a son, and we named him Nash. And at nine and a half months old, he went home to be with the Lord. And kind of a tragic story, and out of it, I began to cry out for inheritance. We were just praying, Lord, have your inheritance here. And, and I was asking for inheritance out of Psalm 2, and I had a prophetic friend give me a dream that in the midst of cultural war, 
God was going to raise up what he was giving to me is called Nasherites. And they would be an army of intercessors who may not be known in the eyes of men, but they're going to be famous in heaven. And I'm going to send revival to their homes, revival to their churches, and revival to their nations. And I said, Lord, give me 100 million Nasherites all over the globe that would not rest to see revival, salvation of Israel, return of the Lord. And so that's begun to spark a movement, and we're now beginning to hit regions with it. We had our first one in Florida in February, and we're coming to Fayetteville, North Carolina here in two weeks. Will Ford's going to be there. Matt Gilman's going to be there. We've got a whole crew. And if you want to be marked afresh with the spirit of prayer, I invite you to join us. There's a QR code for that. And you guys join us. Amen? All right, if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. I love it that you guys are doing this series. You know, we pull little excerpts from it from time to time. It's kind of a, there's phrases in it that, you know, many people know. But guys, there is nothing more countercultural, more explosive than the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 4, Jesus comes out of the 40-day testing in the wilderness. He goes through the 40-day fast, and he comes out of that fast on fire. He hits the region with the spirit of revival. He's teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing, delivering, and the tens are turning into hundreds, are turning into thousands, and Jesus gathers them to the Mount of Beatitudes. He gathers them to the Mount of Beatitudes, and I love it because at the very beginning of Matthew 5, it says he went up on a mountain. Last year in June, I went to Israel and got to preach Sermon on the Mount on the Mount of Beatitudes, one of the greatest moments of my life. My goodness. Don't get much better than preaching Sermon on the Mount at the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus went up on the mountain. The disciples were gathered to him. And I love this phrase, it says he opened his mouth. He opened his mouth. The one from eternity past, the eternal word of God, is now going to open his mouth. We've seen him preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But outside of repentance, we don't know what he's preaching or what he's talking about. And what I love about Jesus is that he uses revival to preach the Sermon on the Mount. At a height of gathering, he, he's going to call them to say, hey, you want to be more than just touched by the kingdom. I want you to build a wineskin both personally and corporately to host the spirit of revival. Who loves revival, huh? We want that spirit of revival. You can feel it just in the air around here. Billy's telling me what's happening on Thursday nights with the young adults. You can feel it in the atmosphere. This is a place God wants to visit. And Jesus wants to do more. He says, guys, I want to do more than just touch you with the kingdom, but I want you to enter fully into what we're calling the constitution of the kingdom, the culture of the kingdom. I call the Sermon on the Mount the declaration of dependence. I call it the wineskin for revival. I call it building, here's another phrase, it's the picture of the interior life of Jesus. And Jesus is going to, with thousands out there, the eternal word of God is going to call forth ones that would begin to host the spirit of revival. And I believe there's an invitation in this series to begin to see a spirit of revival touch you. Because God is attracted to one thing. You know, God has a type. I like to think about it. Me and my wife have been married 25 plus years, so this was way before anything. But now you got your dating apps and all that kind of stuff. You know, you can say, you know, she's six foot, you know, whatever, likes volleyball, athletic, long walks on the beach. That's the kind of girl I'm looking for. That's what gets my attention. God has a type. God has a type that gets his attention. Do you know God is surrounded with 10 billion angels? Do you know God has Genesis 1 on his resume? He has everything. Put Isaiah 66 up here. Isaiah 66, and I don't know if this is a new King James, but I'm going to do my best to read it. 
He says, heaven's my throne, earth is my footstool. Gate city, where is the house you will build for me? Where will be the resting place? Has not my hand made all these things? And so they came into being. Look at this. And he says this, but on this one, next verse, but on this one, next verse. I love the way New King James says it, for he says, on this one will I look. On him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. Poverty of spirit, contrition of spirit, and tremblers. Everybody say tremble. That means this would be my desire after this morning, and if it's not there, don't make it happen. But we're so used to leaving messages going, hmm, I was so encouraged today. I was so blessed. When you begin to tremble, you leave saying, you know what, I don't really feel like eating lunch today. This message demands that I make a change in my life. What would happen if we shifted from what's for lunch to I can't eat lunch? What would happen if we began to say, if what that preacher said today is true, I've got to change things in my life. Well, this is what Jesus does in the Sermon on the Mount. He's going to open his mouth. In Matthew 5, he's going to appeal to everyone's longing for greatness, happiness, and success. And what I love about Jesus, he hits things like poverty of spirit, meekness, hungering and thirsting, mourning. And Jesus is going to drop the most anti-American an anti-system of this world message you've ever heard. There's nothing more anti-American than the Sermon on the Mount. Don't make it cute. Be nice to others because they're nice to you. And Jesus is walking around like a little hippie that wants everybody to get along. He's not a little hippie and into kumbaya. He's dropping a nuke on the planet as he's, in, as he's dropping the, the kingdom of heaven saying it's in direct opposition to the kingdoms of this world. It is a direct affront against everyone's definitions and metrics of success, happiness, greatness, awesomeness. This is a direct affront against the kingdoms of this world. It's not nice, it's not cool, and it's like, but it's a direct opposition and confrontation. Because can I tell you, Jesus is inviting us into freedom. Who wants to get free? Three of you do. Good. I'm glad we got three. If I can get three of you, we can change the world. Because this is what Jesus is hitting. We, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, because he's confronting the ones who are flexing in their riches, in their possessions, in their, in their power. And all of their things, and this is what Jesus is hitting through the, through the Sermon on the Mount. The money, the possessions, all the stuff that you think is happiness is actually corroding your interior life. And it's actually releasing a spirit of heaviness upon you. And it's actually increasing your depression. It's actually increasing your anxiety. It's actually increasing the dullness that you live in. And yet we keep drinking from the water fountain because America says that's what's happy. And Jesus is saying it's a lie. It's a lie. It's all a lie. It's all a deception and an illusion that if you keep drinking from and make that your primary sources, you will end up hollow, empty, and depressed. You know, in Matthew 11, he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I would say that's 99.9% .9 of the American church. It's not you in a hard season because you're on the brink of burnout. It's the ones who have been seduced by the lie. It's the ones who have gotten their hearts and their souls weighed down, oppressed, dull. The word is not delightful. 
Prayer is not enjoyable because you got an oppressed spirit weighed down. Jesus says, I want you to come and learn from me. He says, for I am meek and gentle and lowly in heart. He's pretty much defining Sermon on the Mount. And he goes, you're going to find rest for your souls if you can learn from me. Jesus is going to drop a nuke on the planet by releasing the eight Beatitudes. He's going to confront every illusion and delusion on the inside of us. He's going to talk about there are corrosions and things that you better not entertain. I know we live in a culture that says it's okay to live with your offense. I know we live in a culture that says you need to sit in what's been done to you. But Jesus said, you better deal with the seeds of anger because it'll turn into murder. Jesus, that's not nice. But all my therapists said I can sit in it and coddle it and say it's okay. I'm grateful for therapy. I'm grateful for counseling. It's brought a lot of health and life in my world. But I'm here to tell you when it gets into you living as a victim and coddling your offense, I'm here to tell you it's actually grounding a spirit of anger that will turn into murder. Jesus will not coddle it. So we got to understand how that thing works. He talks about eye adultery leads to heart adultery, which leads to physical adultery. He says, hey, we're not ones looking to get out of marriage. We fight for marriage. We don't use big words. We're just people of our word, and we forgive. And then Jesus is going to take us into some practices that if you give yourself to, it will cause the Beatitudes to explode on the inside and for you to get light and buoyant in your spirit. I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Jesus is really going after deliverance in the Sermon on the Mount. Look with me in verse 5. He's going to talk about giving. He's going to talk about fasting. He's going to talk about forgiving. But I want to talk to you about prayer for the next 20 minutes, 18 and a half minutes. You with me? You guys were dancing during worship. Now you're getting all weird on me. You guys getting all weird? I thought you talked to us. Guys, I've been in Denver for the last season. They just, they just listen to you. I thought if I come to the south, you'd yell at me or something. Like church crickets in here. Don't get weird on me, please. I need this. I'm an Arkansas boy. I need the southern comfort. I need the southern comfort of being talked to from my people. <laughs> when you pray, first off, can I just tell every one of you, you were made for prayer. God's designed you for prayer. God has designed you for connection to God. God has designed you for communion with God. God has designed you for conversation with God. And can I tell you, you better stop living through intercessory missionaries in this room. God hasn't invited intercessory missionaries or people in the prayer room. Friends, this ain't some religious exercise for the called ones. You are designed by God and for God. And you'll only be satisfied in God. And he doesn't want Billy praying for you. He wants to talk to you. We're not going to live through vicariously through the intercessors. No, friends, angels behold and reflect glory. Humans get to commune with glory. Humans get to fellowship with God. We're the only creature that gets to relate with God spirit to spirit. Angels say holy. Humans get to commune with him, those made in his image and according to his likeness. God's designed you for prayer. Hallelujah. 
Everybody say, don't be religious. All right? Don't be religious. God wanted to, Jesus wanted to release a 12 gauge to the spirit of religion as it releases prayer. And he goes, I want you to study the Pharisees. Okay, let's all get our notebooks out. Jesus, uh, Jesus is just gangster for this. He says, okay, look at the Pharisees. Look, look at the verse. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. I mean, he's talking to thousands here. I imagine the word got out. He called them hypocrites. He goes, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in synagogues and on the corners of the streets. Why? They want to be seen by men. The prayer, the call to prayer is an invitation for deliverance, getting delivered from the eyes of men, getting delivered from the opinions of men, getting delivered from the likes on Instagram, getting delivered from the reels on TikTok. We live in a generation today that everything is secular, has to be, I mean, everything sacred has to be shown going deep in the word. <laughs> There's your reward. Everybody thinks you're awesome. There's your reward. You could have had heaven shining on you, but now you got 100 likes on Instagram. There's your reward. 100 people think you're holy. He says, get delivered from superficiality of super spirituality of looking awesome. And doing it all for people. Get delivered from people. Get delivered from religiosity. That's why we can get up here and go dancing when the right chord progression gets and we sit down and dullness hits us. One is the word pressed on us confronts dullness in us. Sit in front of a movie for two hours, just sitting there. I got to pee on myself. I'm sitting there. I ain't moving. You know you can pause it. I know, but I need to watch it. 30 minutes in Bible time, you've had three bathroom breaks. (laughs) All right, I'll I'll stop that. I'm going to stop. I shouldn't have done that. It was too far. It's too far, too far. (laughs) Too far. All right, look at this. Jesus says, okay, look at them. They're hypocrites. They love to be seen by everybody. Stay up there. Keep going with me. He goes, they want to be seen by men assuredly. Oh, this is terrifying. They have their reward. All right. Jesus then goes on to the next one, and he says this. He says this, but you, everybody say me. He goes, when you pray, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go into your room. And once you get into your room, I want you to shut the door. Everybody say, shut the door. You know why he told you to shut, your, shut the door? Because he knew you'd try to get out. I literally picture this, and he goes this, pray to your father. Everybody say, father. It's not religiosity. It's not talking to people. It, it's connection with Abba. He goes, I want you to pray to your father. Where's he at, saints? In the secret place. And your father who sees in secret, he will reward you openly. God will openly validate someone who's gotten delivered from outside approval. God will always openly validate the people who have gotten delivered from the applause and the rejection of men. He will always say, because it's so rare, when God finds it, he goes, this is what what I'm trying to tell everybody. And by the time you're rewarded openly, you don't care. Because you're trying to get back to the secret place. I literally picture this going into your room and shutting your door. I think of the, the room as two realities. Number one, I think of a specific time and place every day that no amount of opportunity, 
nor amount of difficulty can talk you out of that appointment. Some of you it's 6 a.m., others it's midnight, others it's the commute to work, but you need to find your room. Some of you it might be the cab of your truck, it might be the walk in that park, it might be that, it might be a literal room, a literal closet, but friends, we need to prioritize and be intentional about this relationship. Because I've found that the devil will let Corey Russell fill his schedule with traveling the world. There's not too much resistance. I don't get too much warfare over the devil letting me fill up my schedule with speaking engagements. Do you want to know what puts the devil on notice? And when every crisis that's never happened happens, it's when I begin to shut the door. I literally picture this like a, I've come out of drugs, so I've seen a lot of these, these dudes. I literally picture a heroin addict coming off of heroin as they're going on the awkward journey of getting detoxed from all the noise, all the voices, all the opinions, all the stuff that is saturating our culture, and we're like heroin addicts getting delivered from noise and voices and money. And we're beginning to go on the awkward journey of familiarizing ourselves with Abba, who we barely know. We're not comfortable with intimacy. And a lot of us have a lot of wrong views about God. So nobody likes being alone with somebody ugly, boring, who doesn't like us. Does anybody in here like hanging out with ugly, boring people that don't like you? I know there's a couple of you, probably some of the greeters out here. You're like, I'm just happy. I love you, brother. I can't stand you. I love you. (laughs) Jesus says, I want you to pray to your Father in the secret place. Go to the next verse. He says this, don't get lost in your words. Don't use vain repetitions. They think they're going to be heard for many words. Don't be like them. Father knows that you have need of before you ask him. Friends, I want you to know it's not about having the right puzzle pieces of language and prayers. The greatest prayer in the Bible is help. And then Jesus is going to teach us how to pray. Do you know the disciples were in every revival service for three and a half years? Do you know they heard every message? They witnessed every miracle, saw every deliverance. They witnessed every healing, every resurrection, and they never asked Jesus once, teach us to preach, teach us to heal, teach us to do miracles, teach us to prophesy. Why? After spending three and a half years with the Son of God, they said, teach us to pray. And Jesus says, well, the first thing you've got to learn about prayer, it's not primarily about your list. God wants to rip up some of your list in this season. Because most of you, your prayer lives are weak. It's because your views of God are weak. Rip your list up for a season. It ain't about Aunt Betty's toe right now. It's about you connecting to God. It ain't about the same person you've been praying for. You'll get to that, but you've got to first reconnect to who you're talking to. So Jesus said, when you pray, say, everybody say, Father. Say, in heaven. Say, hallowed be your name. Note that the prayer doesn't start with, I need my electric bill paid. Change that person to ask me to forgive them for all the wrong things they've done. God, when's my calling going to get unfolded? When's my destiny going to get unlocked? It doesn't start with your destiny getting unlocked, but it begins with you seeing a person. And this person is unlike any person you've ever met, it's the greatest adoption movement ever, is that Jesus has shared his dad with the whole world. Friends, can I talk about Abba for a second? We're talking about the one who is from everlasting. 
We're talking about the one who measures the heavens with the span of his hand and all the waters in the palm of his hand. He's the one who humbles himself to behold the things that are in the universe. There's no one like him. He is infinite in his glory, and he's infinite in his compassion, in his kindness, in his generosity. He is mighty and powerful. He's a provider. He's an inexhaustible storehouse of glory and goodness, and he's really kind and generous. And you and I get to call him Abba. We get to call him Father, the most deep, intimate, endearing term from a child to his father is Abba, I belong to you. He's the Luke 15 father that sees a son that's been partying in Vegas for a few years and then sees him completely bankrupt, runs to him, embraces him, kisses him, and gives a second inheritance again. He's the father that runs out to the son that's been in Vegas, and he runs out to the older son who's trying so hard in religious perfectionism to be perfect. And he runs out to him and embraces him. And Jesus says, you need to connect. You're talking to a father. He's a father of glory. He's a father of light in whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. He's a father of mercies. He's our father. And where's he at, saints? In heaven. Everybody say in heaven. You know, heaven isn't waiting for you after you die, but it's accessible now through the blood of Jesus. Here's your prophetic word for 2024. Lift your eyes to the ceiling. Look at it. Look at the ceiling. Scoliosis is getting healed right now. Neck problems. Back problems are getting healed right now. Because our posture's off, saints. We need a chiropractic adjustment. It's because you've been looking at phones, and you've been looking at each other, and you've been looking at your TVs, and you've been looking at the culture. And you've been looking at society, but you haven't been looking at Abba. Promise me this. I'm going to tell you, a lot of people go, yeah, I'm connected to the Father on the throne. We'll see, based in November, how much emotional real estate takes place inside of you. When whoever gets elected, to the degree of the real estate of emotions on the inside of you that you get swirled in November is the degree you're not connected to the throne. He's in heaven, saints. You know, Jesus lifted his eyes three times in the Gospels, and he prayed to the Father before he fed 5,000, before he raised Lazarus, and before he prayed John 17. He was looking at the sky, and you know what? Jesus didn't close his eyes when he prayed. Because Abba isn't a figment of our imagination. He's a real person. And Jesus would talk to him like he's talking. Jesus moved back and forth between talking to the Father and talking to us. Talking, talking. He just lived it because he saw him. In heaven, there's a door standing open in heaven over every one of you in this room. Who in here has given your life to Jesus? I want every one of you to know there's a door standing open over your life. You're like, brother, you don't know what kind of week I had last week. I don't care. The door is not dependent on your last week. The door is not contingent on how you feel in this season. There's an open door, and there's an invitation through the open door, and the invitation is come up here. Come up here. Come out of religion. Come out of sin. Come out of you. And come to me. And one sits on the throne. There's a throne set in heaven. There's a throne over Washington, D.C. There's a throne over every power base in the world and every principality and every ruler and every dominion. There is a throne set in heaven. 
and that Jesus Christ is sitting at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. And he's raised us up together with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Come to the throne, children. Let's go. There's a throne. The one on it shines, burns, rainbow. We get to call him Abba. There's 24 thrones around the throne, sitting, robed, and crowned. This is what you and I look like in the presence of God. From the throne proceeds lightning, thunderings, and voices. Four living creatures burning around the throne saying, what are they saying, saints? Kind of sounds like, hallowed be your name. Could Jesus have been talking about Revelation 4 in the Lord's Prayer? Yes. Most of us view God like a middle class working dad with seven billion children. Middle class working dads have good hearts, but limited resources. And you know what? That ain't God's fault. That's an idol you made. That's an idol you made. He's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We go through motion, saints. We go through all the, the motions and the fake hallelujahs, and we check a, a weekly box off called go to church. And yet we live the other six days and 23 hours disconnected from him. There's an invitation for you in your personal life, but God's given this house a specific gift. There's only a couple in the earth that actually can say for the last 18 plus years, 24-7 has been going on here. There's only a small number of places in the earth and yet God in his sovereign kindness has placed it in the heart of Gate City, a 24-7 house of prayer that's called that you can come here. You can't sleep it too. You can drive over here. That you can meet God and rearrange your life. You can have a men's prayer meeting at 6 a.m. Before work, you can come after work with the kids at 6 p.m. You have a place that's an invitation. You know, Jesus told Bethsaida and Chorazin, he says, woe to you, for if the things that were done here were done in Sodom, what it means this is that when God benefits and graces you, there's more accountability. When God gives you a 24-7 prayer room and you go, I haven't been this year, Jesus, I think, wants to talk to you about that when you stand before him. Because he told them, so Leonard Ravenhill wrote the book, Sodom Had No Bible. Which means there's higher accountability when God gives more of himself. And you're like, I'm too busy. But yeah, Timmy's never missed a soccer game. Timmy's never missed a soccer game. You're like, hey, man, this is getting too, this is getting too tense. We're done. All right, zero up here. No, I, I'm, I'm saying it facetiously, saying it's just too uncomfortable. I mean, it, it does this, is this really going to touch our lives? Jesus puts prayer at the center, personal prayer, corporate prayer, because it's not my Father who art in heaven. It's our Father. It's our Father. It's a corporate family. It's together underneath in the house of prayer. My father's house is the house of prayer. And God has given a gift to this house to be a sign to the southeast gate and to the region and to the nations of the fame and the worth and the majesty of Jesus and the power of what happens when you put prayer back at the center. I believe he wants to blow upon the embers strengthen the intercessors. 
get some people in here because I want to tell you it's awkward for everyone. It's awkward for everyone that begins to go on the journey of prayer as you're beginning to get to know him and we realize I don't know you. It's okay. Can you stay in the awkwardness for a second? I don't know what to do. Here's something. Don't do all the talking. Don't do all the talking. Sit there and just sing things to him and say, I love you, and I want to know you, and I don't know how to do this, but I'm going to keep showing up. i got a 30-minute window. God will show up in this room. And I'll keep showing up and be awkward with you, but i got to know you for real. I promise you everything will break. Every crisis will ensue. But you go, I'm not going to miss that 30 minutes. You watch what God does. Amen, let's stand. Sodom had no Bible. 99% 99% of the, 99.9% of churches in the earth don't have a 24-7 prayer room. It's really simple. He responds to hunger. He comes where he's wanted. I'm speaking to full-time working people, but I'm also speaking to house of prayer people that are given to this full-time. Let's re-sign up. Let's reconnect. Let's go again. Give our strength, our energy, our dreams. Break through the boredom and the disillusionment. Break through the disappointment. Break through the limp that you live in regarding your finances. And just say, I'm going to quit living in Victimville. And I'm going to push in to the last thing God spoke to me. And the last thing God said to me, get to the prayer room. Get to the prayer room. There's an invitation for us. Just open your hands right now. He'll meet the hungry right now. You're like, God, I, I don't care where, what stage you're at, where you're at, how, anything. If you reach for him right now, he will meet you right now. God. I want you to begin to pray. Pray in the spirit all over the room. That's it. Lift your voice. Come on. Louder. Louder. Forgive us. Release the spirit of prayer upon Gate City. Release the spirit of prayer on Gate City. Release the fresh fire on the altar. Fresh fire on the altar. A fire on the altar shall never go out.
we're going to continue in this vein of prayer, but I want to invite everyone who has a, a who's a parent, if your children are being ministered to right now, go ahead and grab them, pick them up, and feel free to come back. We're going to stay in this posture of prayer and cultivate what the Holy Spirit is doing right now. So remain at the altar. We're going to remain in this state, but if you have children, please pick them up and then bring them back here in the sanctuary.
so we're going to transition this time in the sanctuary. If God is moving on your heart, then I want to invite you to stay and remain at the altar. But we're going to transition and release the worship team, and we'll see you back next Sunday, Gate City. We also have our um, gatekeepers intensive meeting, the informational meeting that will be going on in room 12. So if you heard that invitation and you want to find out more about a season that can change your life and you'll be able to stay in the place of prayer for many weeks on end, then I invite you to go to room 12 and hear about more of that opportunity. Love you, Gate City. See you next week.